Hey, welcome back to The Dive. On the show today, we have a very special guest, David Morgan from The Morgan Report. David will share his thoughts on the US dollar, inflation, oil, interest rates, silver, and gold. But before we bring you David's interview, do me one quick favor and just go ahead and smash on that subscribe button below me there so we can keep making you these videos. Hey, David, welcome back to The Dive. Well, thank you. Good to be back. Yeah, it's great to have you back. Okay, so let's dive right into it here. Uh, according to the latest figures from the Treasury Department, America's gross national debt has topped $31 trillion for the first time. Yet the US dollar is at its strongest levels in 20 years. How much longer can this continue? Well, I wouldn't say indefinitely, but probably longer than a lot would believe. And I want to correct you. First of all, you're absolutely correct at 31 trillion as far as the official number. But if you look at the work that uh, Professor Skidmore brought to light by Catherine Austin Fitch shows, there's at least 21 trillion on off budget items. So the true debt is in the like 50 trillion range. So I just want to make that point. But as far as continuing, the reason that it's so strong is that most of the debt was denominated in US dollars. So if you were importing from Argentina or India or some of these other nations and you took your debt out in dollars, now you've got to print as many Argentine pesos as you possibly can and devalue your currency by like 100 percent to be able to pay back to uh, exchange it in the foreign exchange markets for dollars and pay off your debt. So these other currencies are falling relative to the dollar because, again, they've got to pay it back in so that means that this charade can continue for some time. But anything that there's too much of loses value. So if there's too many dollars, they start to lose value, as they have. I mean, the dollar from 1913 till now is worth about two cents. And yet, relative to other currencies, it's very strong right now. But there's a point, some crossover in the future, and I don't know how far out, where the system will just start to unravel because these dollars become worth less and worth less and worth less. And that's happening as we speak because the true inflation rate is measured by the government's about eight and a half percent. If you go back to the original calculation from shadowstats.com, it's over 18%, which is higher than what it was in 1979, 1980, when we were facing a currency collapse. So I don't think we're too far away, but uh, don't give up on the dollar just yet. It will be very strong until it isn't. Do you think that there's a way to fight inflation without causing an economic downturn? I don't at this point. I think that uh, no matter what the Fed does, it's in a box. I mean, they continue to raise interest rates that cause the Great Depression. Or they could pivot and start to lower interest rates and cause a hyperinflationary depression. So you can have a debt depression or a hyperinflationary depression, but you're going to have a depression. Well, earlier this week, Australia's central bank um, surprised the markets by lifting interest rates by a 25 basis point rate hike. What do you think the story is in Australia? I think it's the same as in Great Britain and these other nations, as I was alluding to before, is they're already seeing what they must do, and that is to keep their interest rates low and print. And so their currencies are going down. It's what Jim Dines used to refer to as a race to the bottom. It's who can print the most the fastest. I mean, it's not that the U.S. dollar is that strong. It's just they're printing at a less rapid pace. And as I said, the debt markets are favorable to the reserve currency, which is the U.S. dollar, which means most of the bond market or debt markets are based in that currency. And so to pay it off, you need to have that currency. But the race to the bottom has begun, so it's evident in Australia, Great Britain, Argentina, Turkey, Iran, you name it. I mean, most of these places are in, uh, in dire straits and they're printing their, their little brains out. Now, there's talk about some countries potentially creating a commodity-backed currency. Is that something that you envision happening? I think it's an almost inevitable. It depends on the adaption of what the powers that want to be create for us, which is an unbacked, unsound spy mechanism called a central bank digital currency. They'll probably be global in nature eventually. That's what they want, but I'm not sure that'll be implemented. 
it may be tried and fail, and then we'll go back to some type of tie to sound money, uh, gold or gold, silver, or perhaps oil. It's hard to say. So commodity backed standard, real things for real things. I think that's almost inevitable, but I think we're going to stumble there. I don't think we're going to get there directly. Now, OPEC announced a 2 million barrel per day uh, cut to oil production. How do you think that Biden will ultimately respond? Whatever his, whatever his masters tell him to. I mean, <laughs> they'll probably uh, continue to deplete the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is a mistake, but they'll probably do that for a while to try to keep the gas prices down going into the midterm election. But that will fail. And uh, other than that, I don't really have any good guesses. I mean, he's already gone over and got on bended knee and begged for OPEC to increase production rather than decrease production. And I guess they gave him the middle finger based on what you just said. So um, everything's basis, energy, oil. I mean, you know, we talk finance all the time and it's important, but it's really a subset of how much energy there is available. And when there's less energy available, there's less ec economic activity there. And less economic activity means a lower standard of living for everybody. Let's move on and talk some silver here. We've seen you calling out the bottom and now we're above $20. What do you think happened here? And are we going higher or lower from here? Both. <laughs> All markets move up and down. Uh, we may get another pullback. I mean, we're not too far away from tax loss selling. There will be tax loss selling in, uh, certainly in the mining equities and it'll probably spill over into the metal itself. I think the bottom is in, and uh, we are going higher and much higher over the next couple of years, but in the short term, it's a pretty tough call. I'd say by the end of the year, it'll probably be higher, probably in the 21, 22, 23 range, hard to know. I don't make a big deal about being wrong in the short term. I try to catch the bottoms and catch the tops. I'm much better at calling the tops than I am the bottoms, but uh, this last bottom, it looks like I might be right because the gold-silver ratio is favoring silver now, which means it's outperforming gold. And we had, I think it was a 9% move, uh, which is the biggest move in silver in quite some time in one day, and it stayed there all day long. So that's also very bullish. So we got to back and fill, as it said in the trade, meaning that uh, we have to digest these gains and then see where we go from here. But the ultimate move will be much higher. The problem is that the paper markets will pretty much have to be um, not trusted for the system to uh, really go where it needs to go. I'll just digress for a moment, but if you look at what happened to the nickel market, I mean, it shows you how this basically corrupt slash criminal element exists. When the nickel market failed on paper, rather than being a free market, well, you made a bad bet and you lose. The uh, exchange came in and protected the person on the wrong side of the trade or the entity on the wrong side of the trade. That's totally against every free market principle ever developed. I mean, it's, it's absolutely wrong, but yet this is the way the system works. Okay, well, David, we'd also like to get your outlook on gold, if you will. Gold has done a pretty good job, better than silver at this point in time. I mean, it's had a compounded annual growth rate of around 10%. I mean, if you look at what, uh, you know, when the Fed started, if you had a million dollars in paper and a million dollars in gold coin, that gold coin would be worth 90 million in fiat right now. So over the last 112 years, gold's done a pretty good job. Or you could look over the last 50 or the last 10, basically, it's preserved your wealth. It's not supposed to make you rich. It's supposed to make sure that you keep what you have. And it's actually done that, even though there's a lot of detractors to it. Gold has outperformed the S&P and the bond markets since 2000. Better than both of those. And yet gold doesn't do anything. Gold doesn't go anywhere. Well, gold uh, is known by portfolio analysis to be required if you want to have the best gains in a long-term uh, portfolio. In other words, if you are a long-term investor and you use your brain, you are going to contribute gold into the mix because without it, you're not going to do as well. But these things are not what you'll hear on the mainstream financial press at all. They don't make the commissions on gold that they make on their stocks, options, futures, CDOs, I mean, you know, ETFs, you name all these um, derivatives products, and those are the most. The most uh, 
financial products now aren't real financial products, they're derivatives of once upon a time financial products. So it's a real mess. It's a big gambling casino and it's failing. Okay, David, one more thing before we let you go here. Is there anything besides the precious metals that you're uh, bullish on at the moment? Well, I think there'll be some cryptos that probably do well. I'm not a big crypto fan, but I don't want to be so close-minded as to say there won't be other asset classes. I think anything that's needed, just like in the Great Depression, will be well. I, so there are opportunities. You just need to figure out what society really needs, not what they want, and fill that. And if you do, you're probably going to have a very viable, very uh, good business opportunity. So there will be opportunities. There always are. And it's just finding that niche or that place that you need to, you know, come up with something that's, again, needed. Uh, a lot of um, the superfluous stuff will go away. I mean, you're seeing it with the latest iPhone, right? I mean, people used to line up around the block overnight to get the latest model. And now it's ho-hum. The one I've got works just fine. I really don't need a new one. And that's sort of a metaphor for what's going on in society at large. And you'll see that continue. It's going to be more about what I need. I need more, um, you know, money to eat properly than I do to get a new couch or a new iPhone or a new TV or any of that stuff. So big shift economically for everybody across the planet. Well, of course, it won't affect the billionaire class, but I'm speaking of everybody else. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on today and joining us, uh, David. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and get your insight. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you all so much for watching today. We'll be back again tomorrow with the latest news and updates. So be sure to stay tuned by hitting that notification bell and subscribing below. Thanks and goodbye.